Good afternoon, everyone. If you're unfamiliar with me, my name is Dr. Jeff Durbin. I'm an exo brass performing artist. I'm the professor of low brass at Washita Baptist University, and I'm a member of Presidio Brass based out in San Diego, California. It is a sincere pleasure to be giving this short presentation based on my doctoral dissertation, Leonard Falcone, Artist, Conductor, Pedagogue. Since you're here at the Falcone Festival, it's safe to assume that you're familiar with Leonard Falcone in some respect. The goal of my research initially was to thoroughly uncover why Leonard Falcone is regarded as such a figure of repute in the modern day. In my experience, most people who know of Dr. Falcone are familiar either with his groundbreaking baritone records, his 40-year career as director of the Michigan State Band, or with this festival and its prestigious competition. However, in the end, what I uncovered suggests an even more substantial impact. When observed through the right lens, it's clear that in the 20th century, he became a catalyst for the direction taken by euphonium performance and composition forever. Indeed, he deserves credit for his contributions to the euphonium at a critical time in our history. Because of the decline of professional civilian concert bands in the United States during the 1920s, the instrument was actually in danger of falling into obscurity. For simplicity and clarity, this presentation, much like the dissertation on which it's based, is organized into four parts. Falcone's life and background, the euphonium's role in early American band music, Falcone's teaching style and pedagogy, and the overall impact of his life's work. Leonard Falcone was born in Roseto Valfortore, Italy, in 1899, the youngest of three sons. His first taste of band performance came at the age of eight in the Italian concert band tradition. The local ensemble, the Roseto Valfortore Municipal Band, was well known and highly skilled. Falcone began studying alto horn with the band's renowned conductor Donato Donatelli in 1907 with the hopes of being admitted into the famous conductor's ensemble. It was the practice of the village that all young boys could take a 15-minute lesson with Donatelli five times a week, free of charge. After one year of study, he auditioned and was admitted for membership into the band. His first year, he continued to play alto horn, a part normally reserved for accompanying passages. Later, in 1908, he began to study with the band's principal cornetist, Filippo de Cesare, and in 1911, he was promoted to the trombone de canto role. In this new role, he would be responsible for more melodic passages and solo playing, and he would also be taking on a new instrument, which Falcone referred to simply as a valve trombone. His mentorship with Cesare lasted until Falcone left Italy. Falcone emigrated to the United States in 1915, three years after his brother Nicholas had done so. They settled in Michigan and secured positions in a theater orchestra, supplying music to silent films, a common job for musicians of the time. Nicholas played clarinet and served as conductor, while Leonard usually played his valve trombone. The Falcone brothers slowly gained a reputation as skilled musicians in the community. In 1917, by happenstance, Falcone won a violin in a raffle. Having always been fascinated with the instrument, he enrolled in the University School of Music in Ann Arbor in the hopes of getting his performer's certificate. During school, he continued his career in the theater, adding violin to his arsenal and giving his local reputation more potency. He studied violin from 1917 to 1924 and progressed rapidly, surprising even the faculty. His training as a string musician became fundamental to his approach to the teaching of brass instruments, especially in relation to tone, airflow, sensitivity, and vibrato. In 1924, he won a violin audition with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, forcing him to decide between a career in performance or education. Ultimately, Falcone realized his deep desire to become a teacher, and he turned down the job with the DSO. In 1927, Falcone was hired at Michigan State College of Agriculture and Applied Science as the director of the band and teacher of all wind instruments. 
Falcone's presence was immediately felt, as his predecessor had been fired for allowing the standards of performance to slip during his tenure. Therefore, Falcone, asserting his strict expectations and sense of responsibility and discipline, ushered in a new era for the MSC band. Indeed, the fledgling band program swelled under its new head, and before long, Falcone had crafted it into one of the most notable band programs in the nation. Leonard Falcone served as director of bands at Michigan State until 1967, by which time the addition of several new faculty members allowed his private teaching load to narrow and include only euphonium and tuba. Under Falcone's leadership, the band program had grown from a single 65-piece unit to nearly 400 participants across three ensembles. Falcone's career as a baritonist began in the theater orchestras, where he would occasionally substitute out his valve trombone. He was initially attracted to the baritone because he was drawn to its warm tone quality and had grown fond of its solo repertoire and important melodic presence in band music. His reputation and fame were kindled in 1923 at the National School Band Competition where he performed Boccolari's Fantasia di Concerto in exhibition. This performance was a rousing success and earned great acclaim from the biggest names in professional band. John Philip Sousa is quoted to have said, I have many fine baritone players in my band, but this Leonard Falcone surpasses them all. This particular performance led to a plethora of solo appearances for Falcone, solidifying his reputation as a baritone virtuoso. The period of time prior to Falcone's appointment at Michigan State is often referred to as the golden age of band, due to the popularity of wind band music as an entertainment genre. This golden age, the generally accepted range being 1880 to 1925, nurtured the success of several prominent band leaders such as John Philip Sousa, Edwin Franco Goldman, Arthur Pryor, and Patrick Gilmore. Each of these bands often used the euphonium as a solo instrument, elevating players like Simone Mantia, Joseph De Luca, and John Raffaola. It is safe to say that with so many concert bands employing euphonium soloists, this period may have fostered the careers of hundreds of professional civilian euphonium players. The works of John Philip Sousa can provide an example of the general role of the euphonium during the Golden Age. The euphonium was often used in a manner parallel to that of the cello in the symphony orchestra, as a primary, tenor-voiced, melodic instrument. In this rather familiar portion of the Stars and Stripes Forever, the euphonium and the cornet work in tandem to voice the melody in a similar way as would the violin and the cello. To reiterate, euphonium and baritone parts of this nature, along with several important early solo works for euphonium, were what initially attracted Leonard Falcone to this instrument. Now in the present day, band music from the Golden Age is looked back on as primarily a vehicle of entertainment and popular music. However, its popularity began to wane in the 1920s. The rise of jazz music and the visual stimulation of the cinema threatened to unseat band performances as a, as a primary source of entertainment and socialization. The rise of the symphony orchestra in the United States would add fuel to this fire. The period between 1880 and 1925 saw the establishment of 19 professional symphony orchestras, including those of Chicago, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Cincinnati, and Cleveland. To contrast this growth, most of the aforementioned professional bands were done touring by 1923. This was a crisis for professional euphonium players across the United States who found no regular role in either medium. The continued trend threatened to obscure the once prominent solo instrument. It should also be said that this by no means diminishes the foundational contributions made by our military ensembles. Rather, it illustrates the rapidly rising popularity of band music as a form of civilian enjoyment and socialization, as well as its rapid period of decline. Ultimately, the fate of civilian euphonium playing was given new life by the academic band movement of the 1920s, which aimed to promote band music in schools. 
Instrumental music programs in the United States began at the start of the 20th century, led primarily by musically educated Civil War veterans. With the professional bands on the decline, instrument manufacturers, fearing a slip in revenue, supported the, the movement to promote band in primary and secondary schools. The establishment of the collegiate band in the 19th century had provided band a home in school previously, but these bands were often more related to the military than they were to music education. With bands in schools becoming more and more common in the grade school setting, this trend would change over the next few decades and support more civilian involvement, especially from students. The National School Band Competition, at which Falcone gave his famous performance of Fantasia di Concerto, was established in 1923 as a way to promote this movement. The movement to improve music education through band programs in schools, along with the advocacy of figures like Leonard Falcone, proves to be a reason why the euphonium and the baritone are, in the 21st century, still considered primary instruments, worthy of serious study. Despite the diminishing interest in professional bands in the United States, Falcone fostered a healthy-sized studio for much of his time at Michigan State. His studio gained a national reputation for excellence and produced such notable players as Roger Barand, Earl Lauder, and Marty Erickson. From his euphonium majors, Falcone did not generally require specific equipment, therefore both large-bore euphoniums and small-bore baritones were featured. However, in step with the changing times, most of his students did play on the large-bore euphoniums. Falcone, Falcone certainly acknowledged the advantages of the new British-style compensating euphonium introduced to the United States in the 1930s, although throughout his career he personally continued to perform and teach on his baritone. To Falcone, equipment was secondary. He believed firmly that the ideas communicated through the music itself were always more important than the instrument through which they were produced. Falcone's unique training, both as a violinist and brass musician, coupled with the environment of his opera-influenced childhood in Italy, has given him a perspective unprecedented among pedagogues. Hearkening on his background in violin, Falcone often equated brass playing elements to string pedagogy, urging his students to imitate the sound and flowing vibrations of the cello. These concepts are particularly present in his approach to tone, style, vibrato, and airflow. He equated the flow of, of air through the euphonium to the speed and weight of the bow on the strings, a known concept mirrored by modern teachers. Falcone's teaching style had very specific priorities. As said before, music was always paramount. Even the most rudimentary of exercises had to be played with the utmost level of musicianship. In general, Falcone taught rhythmic and technical concepts first, believing them to be more difficult to grasp and thus making the lyrical concepts easier by comparison. In all things, Falcone demanded a beautiful, flowing, resonant sound, even while the student was building technique. Marty Erickson remembers working very hard on his Arben scales, with Dr. Falcone challenging his technical proficiency and velocity, but still expecting a beautiful tone and great follow through. Simply put, he was an ever spinning coin of the science and the art behind brass playing. Formal lessons with Leonard Falcone always began casually, and he was flexible with how he conducted each lesson. A warm-up routine typically preceded repertoire, which helped Falcone gauge how the student's time had been spent in the practice room. If tone quality seemed weak or unsupported, a tone-building etude would surely be covered, such as a vocalise by Bordoni. In the same way, if technique was an issue, the student would likely find him or herself playing out of the complete method by Arben. Those who studied with him remarked that Falcone always had a knack for finding that one unprepared etude in your lesson assignments. Or, even if the etude was prepared, still finding plenty of things on the page to mark up for further improvement. Progress was never just good enough. He was always ready to take each student to the next level. However, despite his ferocious teaching style, Falcone's demeanor was always respectful and uplifting. Roger Barron sums up his approach. He fundamentally loved his students and focused on their needs. 
He made it a point to know each student, what they needed, what they did not need, how hard he could push them. Never raised his voice to a student and resented the people who taught that way. In my full dissertation, Falcone's approach to many of the various brass playing elements are analyzed, from buzzing, to articulation, to breathing, to flexibility. However, in the next section, I will briefly discuss the two elements that seem to be hot topics when modern players discuss Falcone's recordings, tone and vibrato. First, it must be understood that Falcone recorded his albums at a time when recording technology was still somewhat primitive, Therefore, the full effect of his tone quality was likely not captured, particularly in the lower register. Roger Barron insists that the recordings don't do his playing justice, and that the real value in listening to his albums lies in observing his phrasing, style, and technique. It must also be understood that Falcone's distinctive tone shape is not a trait which he instructed his students to imitate. He was keenly aware that the small bore baritone would fundamentally create a different sound than the trendy large bore euphoniums. His sense of tone quality was greatly influenced by his training on the violin, which established an appreciation for the flow and free and open vibrations of the strings. This is mirrored in his appreciation for how a brass player's tone quality is created, dependent on a comparable effect generated by the combined vibration of the musician's lips and the instrument itself. He is one of the few brass pedagogues that taught feel when it comes to tone. He expected his students to listen intently to their color and shape, yet also insisted on the importance of feeling and intimately recognized recognizing the vibration of each pitch, a trait that I'm convinced is the reason he played so accurately. Modern pedagogues may scoff at this approach. However, those who remember Falcone's playing seemed not to take issue with the intensity of his air, the shape and flow of his phrasing, the beauty of his tone quality, and they marveled at his impeccable accuracy. The use of vibrato is a major consideration among euphonium players and has long been a defining quality of Falcone's playing. Falcone taught a jaw vibrato, built through rhythmic practice, begun slowly, and gradually increased with the assistance of the metronome. In general, he thought of vibrato in terms of sixteenth notes, with slight adjustments based on meter, tempo, and musical interpretation. This chart shows the general vibrato speed in terms of pulsations per second from various works as recorded by Falcone. As indicated on the chart, he abides by his stance on vibrato at the 16th note. Falcone believed that vibrato should never be faster than 16th notes at 86 beats per minute or 6 pulsations per second. While this was his preferred speed limit, for artistic purposes such as phrasing and tempo, he pushes past it twice in, in the works recorded. The first occurs in Estrelita and the second in Napoli. Admittedly, Falcone's vibrato comes with a certain amount of scrutiny from euphonium players in the 21st century. Some have expressed their opinion that Falcone's vibrato is simply too fast and accuse his style of being outdated. However, when compared to modern euphonium players of similar stature, such as Stephen Mead and Brian Bowman, Falcone's uh, approach to vibrato speed actually seems agreeable with the styles of the late 20th and 21st centuries. Falcone recorded Estrelita on his first album in 1964. Uh...
British euphonium virtuoso Stephen Mead recorded this piece in 1990. Mead's tempo is slightly faster, however his vibrato is slightly similar, still pulsing between 5 and 2 thirds and 6 and 2 thirds times per second. Falcone's recording of Herman Belstedt's Napoli was released on his second album in 1965. When compared to Brian Bowman's 1995 recording, it can be seen that even though several differences are apparent, the nature of their rhythmic approach is similar. Falcone's vibrato rhythm and speed are consistent, pulsing approximately six and a half times per second. Bowman's vibrato is a bit more fluid, at times changing speed within a single note. In general, his vibrato tends to pulsate just over six times per second. After listening to the three artists side by side, it becomes obvious that the biggest difference is not necessarily speed of vibrato, but rather the width and frequency of use. Falcone employs these elements on a more liberal degree than, Be than Mead or Bowman. These aspects likely carried over from his violin training, as string musicians have been known to employ a pitch variance of up to a half step. This is far greater than that of Bowman, who recommends a pitch variance of 10 cents on either side of the pitch. Falcone's high standards and expectations were easy for his students to conceive, as it was ever led by his own example. The energy of his teaching can be equated to that of a jockey driving a stallion during a race, often saying little, but urging, uh, drilling, and encouraging, and then demonstrating it all through his own playing. He believed strongly that a teacher should always play better than his best student, driving him to keep up his own skills even into his 80s. Former MSU professor of clarinet Keith Stein remarks, he was always exemplary and that he didn't say, do as I say, it was do as I do. He was a great disciplinarian, which I think is tremendously important, and he disciplined himself equally. 
As director of bands at Michigan State, Falcone was very involved with the promotion and composition of band music in the United States. He was a founding member of the College Band Directors National Association, which was started in 1941, and he joined the American Band Masters Association in 1951. Following the close of the Golden Age of Band, the American Band Masters Association had been responsible for the commissioning of several new works for band by serious contemporary composers as a way to perpetuate wind repertoire. Noteworthy composers such as Paul Creston, Peter Menon, and Vincent Persichetti responded to the ABA's promptings and contributed major works to the wind band's library in the 1950s. Despite this victory for the ABA, Falcone was displeased with much of the music being written. He was quite vocal about his dissatisfaction regarding the use of the euphonium, in particular the absence of a melodic role for the instrument. He believed the euphonium was best suited when treated like the cello, as a primary melodic voice. The ABA and the CBDNA heard his opinions regularly. At the ABA's National Convention in 1967, Falcone remarked to Colonel William S. Santelman from the President's Own Marine Band that it's as difficult to find a melody in some of those numbers as it is to find the plot of a story in a bowl of alphabet soup. I think most, if not all, serious euphonium players have had roughly the same experience when we sit down in our respective ensembles and prepare to play a new piece of band music that we haven't seen before. All the while you've been practicing Arben, Koprash, Clark, Charlier, you're ready for anything that they can dish out. You look down at your part and your heart sinks a bit when you see only half notes and whole notes, doubled or harmonized with the tuba. Personally, I always wondered why would composers ignore our versatile instrument's technical prowess or melodic potential within its natural habitat. Falcone was just as perplexed and regularly pointed out that the instrument itself seemed to have been forgotten by composers. His point is well conceived, as the mission of the ABA was to convince serious composers to write for band in addition to orchestra or choir. Some of, these comp uh, some of these composers had long histories of writing for the orchestra previously and may have been encountering the euphonium for only the first or second time. This lack of familiarity surely resulted in a diminished level of importance for the instrument. Although a rich and important major work for band, examples of these misuses can be seen in the ABA's 1953 commission, Pageant by Vincent Persichetti. This was Persichetti's third composition for band. However, as can be seen by the score, the euphonium is used primarily as a supporting voice to the tuba, which, which, which it doubles at the octave, fifth, or unison. In other areas of the work, the euphonium serves a similar role, doubling bass trombone and low horn. This is in stark contrast to the melodic use for which, for which Falcone believed the euphonium to be ideally suited. In order for composers to understand how the euphonium is best utilized, Falcone believed strongly that a conversation between advocates and composers is necessary. 
This was put into practice on his home campus of Michigan State. It was at his suggestion that MSU faculty member H. Owen Reed wrote his first composition for band, Spiritual. So successful was his first composition that Reed set to work immediately on a second, La Fiesta Mexicana. As can be seen in the score, Reed approaches the euphonium in a melodic way, often allowing the section to operate independently of the trombones and tuba. Also, it is, it is employed melodically with the higher voiced woodwinds, which harkens back to its use in the golden age of band. Falcone's influence was again seen in the work of composer Alfred Reed, particularly the composition of his second symphony for band. This piece was written for the Michigan State Symphonic Band and contains a substantial role for the euphonium. Other composers influenced either by Falcone or by his students include Mark Camphouse and David Gillingham, who credits Falcone with the renewed attention paid to the euphonium in the late 20th century. As he states, I think his playing and recordings brought the euphonium to a level of respect that influenced many of us in the compositional world to use the instrument in a more soloistic way to exploit its lyrical quality, instead of just doubling it with other instruments. As professional civilian bands in the United States and their repertoire were in decline during the first half of the 20th century, it stands to reason that the amount of solo repertoire for baritone and euphonium followed suit. He wrote on this subject often for educational journals such as The Instrumentalist and The School Musician appealing to composers to answer his pleas for more baritone and euphonium repertoire. This list painstakingly compiled by Falcone himself, details the solos he viewed as attainable quality options for students in 1939. From this list, it is clear composers were still hesitant to write for euphonium. Once analyzed, it can be seen that of the 34 pieces presented, 21 were originally written for trumpet or cornet, and five were written for trombone. Only four of the works are originally written for baritone or euphonium, and they were all written prior to 1925, when the euphonium was still seen as a viable solo instrument. This small percentage of baritone intended solos sourced from the United States is evidence for the lack of appreciation for the instrument's lyrical capabilities. Eventually, Falcone made the decision to take matters into his own hands, producing his own arrangements for baritone, including Julius Klengel's Concertino in B-flat and Leonard B. Smith's collection of solos for young players, the Belwyn solo series for band instruments. Furthermore, because of his unique musical DNA, he adapted for baritone several pieces originally for string or voice, including Jean-Baptiste Senai's Allegro Spiritoso, Giuseppe Tartini's Adagio Cantabile, and Gounod's Ave Maria. Possibly Falcone's most significant contribution to the advocacy of solo repertoire for euphonium was the result of three commercially available albums recorded in the 1960s. These recordings were received with outstanding acclaim from the tuba and euphonium community, with many amazed at his technical expertise and melodic phrasing. Prior to his first album's release, only two other euphonium albums existed in the United States, one by Harold Brash and another by Raymond Young. Despite being the first two, these recordings were not widely distributed or advertised, and therefore Falcone gained the regard of many to be the quintessential sound of the euphonium. Falcone's records are remembered by modern euphonium pedagogues such as Brian Bowman as being significant in his development as a young musician. The decades following the release of Falcone's first album were marked with the composition of several new solo works for euphonium in the United States, including Warner Hutchinson's Sonatina, Donald White's Lyric Suite, John Boda's Sonatina for Euphonium and Synthesizer, Alec Wilder's Sonata for Euphonium, and Walter Ross's Partita for Euphonium. 
While not all of these solos were specifically written for Leonard Falcone, some were written for those inspired by his recordings, such as Brian Bowman, who has said many times, I never officially had any personal lessons with Leonard Falcone. I feel I had many lessons with him from studying his recordings, imitating his style, and learning the solos he had on those records. Indeed, since the release of his albums, there has been a steady incline of euphonium music written, including compositions by Michigan State graduates James Kernow and David Gillingham. This growth can be attributed to the success of uh, Falcone's pro vocal promotion of more contemporary compositions for euphonium and baritone, his acclaimed solo albums, and the clear success of his fierce teaching style. In retirement, Falcone stayed involved with his promotion of the euphonium. In 1971, at the recommendation of Brian Bowman, Falcone was offered a position on the board of directors of the Tubists Universal Brotherhood Association. Bowman believed this organization, which was devoted to the promotion of tuba and euphonium, needed at least one euphonium player on a board that was comprised entirely of tubists. He believed that no one else could represent euphonium players in the United States like Leonard Falcone. Due to the exclusive nature of the word brotherhood found in the title, Falcone was initially hesitant as it reminded him of the mafia and therein the common Italian stereotype against which he carefully contrasted his conduct. But ultimately Falcone accepted the invitation to work with the TUBA and serve on the board. He was also closely involved with the Blue Lake Fine Arts Camp, often serving as guest conductor. He continued his association with both organizations until his death in 1985. The year following Leonard Falcone's passing, one of his former students and president of the Blue Lake Fine Arts Camp, Fritz Stansel, created a tangible outlet to honor Falcone's memory. Thus, he created the Leonard Falcone International Euphonium and Tuba Festival. At its core, the festival is a collection of concerts and masterclasses held every summer at the Blue Lake Fine Arts Camp. Its mission is to further promote the euphonium and the tuba as serious artistic instruments. Recruiting the assistance of such notable figures such as Brian Bowman, Roger Barron, and Marty Erickson, the Falcone Festival premiere was a grand success and has since continued to the present day. Brian Bowman recently expressed that Falcone's presence has still been very strongly felt within the euphonium community. The Leonard Falcone Festival has become the embodiment of that sentiment. It is currently in its 33rd year and has retained possibly the most significant brass competition in the world. The festival is also responsible for a number of commissions for euphonium, including a favorite by many, David Gillingham's Blue Lake Fantasies. This all happened to honor Leonard Falcone, who even in death has made a tremendous impact on American euphonium playing. In some regards, the Leonard Falcone Euphonium and Tuba Festival represents the fullest realization of its namesake's lifelong mission. Through his performing, teaching, and conducting, Dr. Falcone's contributions to the euphonium in the mid 20th century are second to none. When the nature of the instrument was threatened to be forgotten and deemed obsolete, Falcone used his influence as a conductor to help composers remember the role to which the euphonium was best suited. His record albums were impactful among young aspiring players and promoted the, comp the composition of new solo repertoire. To put it simply, any time you pick up a new euphonium solo written by an American composer, you have Leonard Falcone in part to thank for that. His reach is so wide, musicians all over the world can appreciate his exceptional career as well as absorb facets of his teaching. So substantial was Falcone's influence, it is imperative that the international musical community fully appreciates his, li his long-lasting contributions. If you'd like to read more about Leonard Falcone, I would like to suggest Solid Brass by Rita Comstock, The Life and Work of Leonard Falcone by Myron Welch, and my own dissertation upon which this presentation is based, Leonard Falcone, Artist, Conductor, Pedagogue. Please feel free to contact me if that interests you. I want to thank, I want to offer a sincere thanks to Phil Cinder and the rest of the committee members of the Leonard Falcone Festival for asking me to be a part of this event. And thank you for your attention. Be safe, be healthy, go practice.